you know, when you start off, you could always open an old project or hit a new one. Uh, and for this class, it's a reminder, composition, new composition. This is where you change your composition. Uh, we're doing 1920 by 1080, 2K resolution. Your frame rate, the higher the frame rate, the smoother your motion is going to be. I recommend about 24 frames per second just because it's easiest for math. Um, and your assignments are all between 10 seconds and 15 seconds, but your final assignment should be a little bit longer. And don't forget time code. It's going hours, minutes, seconds, frames. So if you want 10 seconds, you got to do 10, period, zero, zero, or else you'll do 10 frames. It okay. If you ever need to change your settings, composition, composition settings, and this is where you can change them. Recap project panels where you add files. Composition is what the viewer is going to see. Your effects are over here, your timelines down here, and your tools are up here. So we started off by talking about the four pillars of motion design. It's, oh, you know what? I'm glad I, you know, caught myself because someone needed it uh, join with computer audio. Hubba, hubba. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but you beat me to it. <laughs> so we start off talking about the four pillars of motion design. And in case you ever forget, I'm just going to put some text. All right. Every layer has them. You go to your twirl down right here. You click the arrow twirl down. We twirl down again. And they're right here. Position, scale, rotation, opacity. That's what we start off with. Keeping it simple, position is, you know, moving things from around on the screen, scale, making them larger or smaller, rotation, and lastly, opacity is fading stuff off and on. So that's where you start off with. Now we're going to recap the, think about what you want to do, figure out how to do it, and then your first step, your playhead is right here in the timeline, and when you click and drag and move it, that's called scrubbing. So you move your playhead to where you want the motion to start. And that's the first step. The second step is your anchor point. You've got to put that where you want your motion to ride from. Because watch this with scale. It's scaling from where that anchor point is. If I change my anchor point with the pan behind tool right up here, if you can't move the anchor point, click off the layer, then click back on. You see it's highlighted. So if I move this to the middle, reminder, if you hold down Control, or command that will snap it to a center, an edge, or a corner. So now when I scale, it's scaling from the middle instead of from the corner. It's the same like that with everything, like rotation. If you want it to swing like a pendulum or put in the middle, if you want it to spin like a propeller. So the anchor point influences your motion. That's why it's step number two. First step, move your playhead. Second point, uh, second step, Move your anchor point with the pan behind tool. And if you can't get to it, click off the layer, click back on again, and now you can move it to wherever you want. All right, so I move my time, my playhead, move the anchor point. Now, think about what I want to do. I'm going to have this just scale down to zero. So scale, I click the stopwatch for what I want to animate, move my playhead to the amount of time I want my change to take place, and then I Make a change. You need a minimum of two keyframes to keyframe animate anything because you know it's scaling down or with position, it's over here, and then it's over there now. So now it's moving and scaling. Just like that. So you know, set your first keyframe by clicking the stopwatch. Move the playhead to where you want the change to happen, and then make your change. You can type in the change. You can hover over, left click, hold it down, and then drag to do that. And wherever you make a change, it's going to create a new keyframe. So be careful of that. If you ever need to change, I suggest using your previous and next keyframe buttons right here. And this is to add or remove a keyframe. So I'm going to delete these. You could also delete keyframes by clicking the stopwatch for a second time. I did that trick question at the beginning of class. If I want this to fade on, stay on the screen for three seconds, and then fade off, how many keyframes is that? And the answer to that is four. So 
We're going to start at zero. I'm going to have it fade on for one second. Change that to 100. So that's my fade on. If I move this, so I want it to be up for three seconds. If I start changing the opacity, it's going to fade off from here to there. I don't want that. I need it to be 100% opacity for three seconds. The easiest way to do that is by clicking the diamond button over here. That makes a keyframe that's the exact same as the keyframe before it. So there's no change over this amount of time. So now I can go forward one more second, change it to zero, and now it's fading on, staying up for three seconds, and then fading off. So that's an example of using the empty diamond to make that duplicate keyframe. It's very useful. All right, so I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna clear my keyframes, and now we're gonna talk about the speed graph. So I'm going to move this up, and over two seconds, it's going to stop right there. That's my motion. The default keyframe is linear, which means there's no change to speed over time. To change your keyframe or keyframes, you can left click and box select, or if you want to select all of them, you can click the word to select all of them. Hover over one of the keyframes, right click. This is where you can get the to toggle hold or your other keyframe options. Most common one we used in class was Easy Ease, and these turn into hourglasses instead of diamonds. Now, Easy Ease is going to slow out that first keyframe and then slow into the second. This is just a recap. That's what we're doing tonight. So, right here is your speed graph editor. There's the speed graph. If you're not seeing it, the value graph, this is what the value graph looks like. This is how much is happening, how much position or how much rotation. It's based off of amount, not based off of speed. The speed graph, I'm clicking this little board here by the eyeball. The speed graph is changing the velocity out of one keyframe and into the next. So I'm gonna click here to magnify my timeline so I can see it more, my graph more accurately. If I box select there, these yellow boxes right here are my keyframes. If I move them up or down, that will change the amount of what is happening, which I do not want to happen. If I move them side to side, that's going to change the timing of my keyframes. So if I want this to fall faster, I can click my keyframe here, left click. I'm holding down shift after I started dragging. Now I move that keyframe one second. So it's now falling twice as fast. So you can move your keyframe side to side to change the timing of your animation. Now changing the velocity of your animation, I'm going to box select again. This yellow ball is the influence handle. I click on this, not the yellow square, because that's going to change the amount. Someone get that? Thank you very much. OK, so got my keyframe selected. If I drag the influence handle towards the keyframe, it's now speeding into that, speeding out of that keyframe, I should say. It's going faster out of it. This is the fastest motion right here. That's the apex of my motion. See, it's falling a lot faster. And if I want, I can exaggerate that more. I'm gonna drag this away. So now it's going very fast out of the first keyframe and incredibly slow into the second keyframe. That's an example of changing the speed graph. Now. This is technically the opposite of what would happen in real life. Really, if I want to, I should speed into that keyframe and slow down out of that one because it's going to fall faster over time. So I could even like that. So I want it to go as fast as possible into the down keyframe, like such. So that's how you get your own custom motion. You set up your keyframes, think about what you want to do, easy ease them, and then edit them in the speed graph editor. To get out of it, just click on there. This is how you zoom in and out of your timeline. And that's your basic workflow as a graphic designer and a motion designer. So I'm going to delete this. That's the basics. Now we're going to start building on that. I'm going to use my pen tool. 
and just draw a shape. Clicking and dragging gives you curved bezier handles. And if you just click, you get straight. I'm going to go back to my arrow, my selection arrow. Clicking the word fill is what brings up the fill options. Clicking the color swatch is what changes the color. So I'm going to do a solid stroke. This is where you change the thickness of your stroke. This right here is how you can zoom in and out of your preview panel. A lot of times I just work in fit. And a reminder right here, this is where you change your preview resolution. I usually work at a quarter resolution. You don't need a high quality preview to look at your motion. You do when you're doing things like color correcting and working on special effects. But most of the times you'll work at a lower resolution to see your work faster. We're going to talk about trim pads. I've got my path right here. Here's my shape. Shape paths, I mean shape layers, everything can be added by layer new, is where you can get your solid and your shape layers. I'm going to bring in a solid layer. And here's where you can set the size. You could always hit make comp size. And I'll make this light green. Hit OK. In my layer stack, what's on top is what you see first. So I moved it below because now I can see it below it. See, layer stack matters a lot. So think about that. That'll solve a lot of your problems. Shape layers, like this right here, it's got a little shape icon. Shape layers have path points, and you can animate those path points. Solids have no path points. You could use them to create a solid color or to put an effect in it from the effects panel. Now we're going to talk about trim paths. I've got my shape layer selected. There's an add right here. Whenever you've got your selection tool selected, which is what you use for moving stuff around, you get an add when you've got your shape layer selected. You could also twirl down here, and the add is right here. They both do the same thing. So I wanted trim pads, so I'm going to add trim pads. I twirl down to get my options. The start is the first point I drew, and the end is the last point I drew. So if I want this to animate, from left to right, that would be my end because this was the first point I drew. To animate a trim path, just like anything else, move the playhead to where you want, click the stopwatch you want, move the playhead for the change that you want to create, and then you can type it in. You can hover, left click, and drag, or sometimes you could just move things manually. So that's it. It's going from zero to 100. That's animating a draw on. If I wanted to draw this off, I think of how long I want the draw off to be. The closer it is, the shorter the draw off is going to be. So I'm going to do about here. So I click the opposite stopwatch to draw it off. And I go right near the end, and I animate that. So that's how you get a draw on and a draw off. I'm going to change this resolution real quick. Right here, these are your render bars, these blue things. Always check your render bars because if they're too close together, like a frame or two apart, you're going to get a render error. You always want them to cover the amount that you want to render, like this one second of animation. That way I can watch it on a loop and fine tune my motion, such as selecting all of it, easy easing, and that'll change the in and out, giving it a little bit more character. You can also do things like click motion blur. And then for every layer you want to have motion blur, right now I'm in my modes. This button right here, toggle switches and modes. These are my switches, these little check boxes. These are my modes with the drop down menus. I want to be in my switches, so I click here. And I can click my motion blur enable. And right there, you can see I've got motion blur on that. So that's just pushing that up a little bit more. You do not have to animate trim pads if you don't want. You could use them to get a custom look to lettering when you're drawing those on. And I'll demonstrate that. So I've got a letter M. Scale this up a bit. To turn this into a shape, I just right click on it. And if you're on a Mac, you would hold down the control key on your keyboard. Go to create. This is where you can make masks or shapes. I want to do shapes. 
it hides my text layer and now I've got shapes. So I can say no fill and then give this a stroke by clicking on stroke, solid, or you can do a gradient, whatever you want. We'll make this a little thicker. Now just a reminder, I do not like seeing fills trim path animated on. You should think more about how that's going to animate on. So if I do a trim path on here, and I don't want it animated, uh, I just want to give this a little bit more character. I can change the start and end point, get a more custom looking letter. Offset changes where those start and end points occur from. So I can really dial in my look. So that's a little example of the offset, how it works, and changing where your trim paths start and end. You don't always have to animate them. Get a little bit more visual interest. It's up to you as the designer. We're going to talk about expressions next. I'm going to give this no stroke and a solid fill. Expressions. Shortcuts for your four pillars of motion design. That's P for position, S for scale, R for rotation, T for transparency. We'll do S for scale. To add an expression, not every stopwatch can have an expression in it, and some expressions don't work in certain stopwatches, but as a general rule of thumb, most of them will allow you to add an expression. You hold down the Alt or the Option key on your keyboard. You've got to hold it down while you left click on that stopwatch. The type turns red, letting you know you've got an expression field, and you type it in. And the first one we learned was wiggle. So I double click to autocomplete. And wiggle is, you know, the first one we learned. The first number is how many times per second, comma, and then the amount of what's going to change. In this instance, it's the amount of scale. So I'll do 300. So four times a second, it's going to randomly scale an amount of 300. And that's what this is going to look like when I hit my space bar. The effect will go as long as the layer is in your timeline. To edit your trim, to trim down your layers, the start, we call that the in point, and the end, we call that the out point, in and out points. To change them, it is these keys on your keyboard. You hit the Alt key or the Option key. This bracket right here looks like the start of your layer. That's the in point. See how that makes that shape? This is the shape of the out point of your layer. So just look at those brackets. That's how you remember. So if I want this to stop wiggling and disappear after this point, I click on the layer, hold down my Alt key, hit that bracket, and now my layer ends there. If I want it to start here, same thing, Alt, hit the other bracket, this one right here, and now my layer only appears for that amount of time. While we're talking about layers, Command D or Control D will duplicate a layer. Command Shift D will split duplicate a layer wherever the playhead is. This is useful when you want to get rid of effects or change the anchor point. And I'll demonstrate that next. Actually, first, I'm going to show you, if I go here, you can have keyframes and expressions at the same time. So I'm going to have this float up and wiggle from side to side. So that's P for position. Position is the only stopwatch. You can select it, right click, and choose separate dimensions. Now I can animate the X and the Y separately. A fast way to get your anchor point to the middle of a layer, hold down the command or control key, double click on the pan behind tool, and it'll snap it to the center of it. Okay, so Y is my up and down, X is my side to side. I'm going to animate the Y. I click, move to how far I want this to go, and I could hover, left click, and drag, or I could use my selection arrow, start dragging, then hold down shift, or I could type in a number, like minus 135, then hit the Enter key on my keyboard. So now it's going straight up and down. Now, if I want to add a wiggle side to side and keep these keyframes, I just hold down the Alt or Option key and kick, click on the X because I want it to go side to side, like the wind is blowing this. So I can add my wiggle expression there. And let's say two times a second, an amount of 45. Now, reminder, you've got to click out of your expression field. I still have the text indicator 
Once you see the arrow appear, that means you can click out of the field. If you have any typos or extra spaces or wrong line breaks in your expression, it will not work properly. So now you can see it subtly drifting from side to side. To make it more pronounced, I just change my numbers. So I'll go 75, click out. Now it's doing that. So that's a quick recap of expressions. We covered wiggle. Um, to do overshoot, that is called um, inertial bounce. We did a squash and stretch expression. We looked at, oh, another expression that is very useful. Let me delete this. And I'm going to put some type. And uh, let's do a noise layer. So I'm going to put a solid down. And I'm going to put in a noise texture. So I'm going to do fractal noise. Put it on my solid layer. OK, evolution. Evolution will animate most things like uh, turbulent displace and some effects. So I'm going to Alt, hold down Alt or Option while I click here, and do the time expression time asterisk and i'll say the higher the number the more it changes so i'll do 500 just so you can see click out of my expression that's using the time it will keep moving something over time that's useful when you see evolution you want change especially when you're doing displacements okay so we we're talking about expressions and i did that next we're going to cover Parenting. I'm just going to move these together. Remember, layer management is very important. Parenting. I'm going to do scale here. I'm only scaling that one layer. If I want the text to scale with this or move with it, I just click on the layer that I want to parent. You could use your pick whip over here. I suggest you get in the habit of using the pick whip, especially when you're using expressions. Or you could use the drop down menu. Both will work. But I'm going to pick whip to the shape right there. So whatever I do to this shape, that's going to happen to my text. So if I rotate it, it's going to rotate with it. Okay? That's part of the power of parenting. Another use for parenting is when you're doing characters, like limbs. So I'm going to use my anchor point, move that, hold down Command or Control to snap it. I'm going to duplicate that, Command D or Control D. I'm going to slide it down to where the next joint would be. I'll say like right about there. Change the color just so you can see what's happening. And then I'll create a quick hand, Control D, move that down. And I'm going to hit S to scale. And remember, it's going to scale upward. You can click the chain to non-uniformly scale, like that. So this would be my shoulder. This would be my forearm. That's my hand. The hand would be parented to my forearm. So I'll name these. You hit the Enter key to name a layer. That's shoulder. This is my forearm. Hit the Enter key to name it. And lastly, that's my hand. OK. The hand would be parented to the forearm. The forearm would be parented to the shoulder. So now, if I rotate this shoulder, the whole arm moves with it. This is also the same for legs. You'd have thigh, calf, and foot. So if I was doing a walk cycle, I would be animating the rotation. So let's say I want to start back here. I click here. I move my keyframe. You can click and drag keyframes in the timeline to change their timing. And then right here, I'd be moving forward. So that's the first part of it. One of the 12 principles of animation, we covered easy ease, that's slow in, slow out. Another one is called follow through and overlapping action. What that means is I would have the different parts of the body moving at different times. So this would be like this, this would be my foot. It would be back a little bit. So I'm going to click these of when I want them to start moving. And it's going to be a little bit after this. And this one's going to start moving 
a little bit after that. The motion starts here and it ends there. So this would be the last thing to stop moving. So I'm going to go a little bit past it, bring up my leg to about where it'd be there, then go a little bit past that and have my foot come through. That's a more realistic look than the whole leg moving together. And again, you could just box select all of these, hover over, right click, easy ease, get that type of motion. That's part of the power of parenting. All right, now we're going to talk about masks. Here's my logo. Let's say I want it to look like it's appearing magically from below this line. You won't see this line. Lines don't render. So appearing, that's position, P. Click my stopwatch. I've got all that set up. And then I can just hover, click and drag, or I could physically drag it if I wanted to. Here's my motion. OK, great. Now masks will show or hide part of an image. So I want it to look like it's magically appearing from here. To make a mask, you have to have a layer selected in your timeline, and then you could use your shape tool or the pen tool. But watch what's going to happen. Add will, whatever is inside your mask you drew will be visible. If you choose subtract, whatever is inside that mask will be dis disappeared. So you can hit the M key to get there. Another one is F for feather. And see, that'll gradate the edges, make them less uh, hard. Now watch what happens. The mask is going to move with the layer. So that's useful to know. So I'm going to hit undo, get rid of my mask. Next, I'm going to talk about pre-composing. To pre-compose, you select one or more layers, right click, and hit pre-compose. I usually put PC at the end, so I know it's a pre-comp. You want to click the move all attributes so it lights up blue. Hit OK. My keyframes are inside this logo. I've got it selected in my timeline. Once more, I'm going to draw my mask. I'm going to choose subtract, but watch what happens. The mask does not move, and the logo text does move. That's because the keyframes are inside here. So this is still moving. I just double clicked to get inside my pre-comp. The mask is on the pre-comp. So that is a little introduction to masks. I'm going to do one more thing with masks. I'm going to bring in an image. To make a video clip, uh, if you click right here on the new composition button, it'll match the duration the frame rate, all this information right here, it'll match perfectly in your timeline. So I'm going to use my pen tool. I've got my video selected and I close it up. I'm gonna hit M for my mask options, close the twirl down, then open it back up. You can animate anything with the keyframe. So I could animate the mask expansion. I could click here, go forward, whatever amount of time I want, and then go in the opposite direction. So I made it go inwards, now making it go outwards. When you feather a mask, it's going to feather it from every edge uniformly, okay? That's important to remember. That's what feather does. I'm gonna delete my mask. Now, if I wanna draw a mask and use the mask feather tool, I've gotta to use my pen tool. I'm going to draw a shape right here, and I'll move that. OK, let me move these up a little bit. The mask feather tool allows you to feather whatever edge you want. So I'm going to add feather points. When I click and drag, that's going to change Right here. So putting a point here, my soft feather gradually comes to an end there. So I can fine tune whatever 
edge I want by adding or subtracting mask feather points. That's how you can get really good compositing and fine tune your special effects by using the mask feather tool to only select the part that you want to have that happen to. Now we're going to talk about alpha mats. First, I'm going to bring in some green screen footage. All right. Now, we were doing a visual effect which relied on shading. And to do that, we had to turn off the overhead lights and we had to flag the lights by making sure they didn't get parts of my face. Because I'll show you what happens with the Luma mat here. All right, so first I want to remove this green screen. To remove the green screen, that's your key light. Throw the key light on. And you use your eyedropper. You pick a color near your subject. And we've got all this gunk because the wall was not evenly lit. I'm going to scrub through my footage, and you will see I'm just lifting my head up and down. So that means I can just mask out that stuff. You also, if you've got like clips or people's hands holding uh, mats, that will be in your shot. So you can just mask those out. So my layer is selected. And I'm going to mask that. And I'm going to mask this. I'm going to set them both to subtract so I don't have to worry about it. There we go. Now we still have this gunk. And I'm going to show you what happens. You start off in final result and you choose your color. Then you go to screen matte. You want to have pure white and pure black. You adjust that with your screen matte settings. So screen the clip white. Now the inside of me is a good mask. Now I got to work on this back wall. That's my clip black. See, just like that, I've got pure white, pure black. Now I go from screen matte, drop down to final result. And that's what my key is going to look like. Let me change this from, now I'm going to keep it on source. Let's try, hard. no, I don't like hard color. I don't like soft color. I'm going to do source. And let me check my mat one more time. Yeah. Go back to final result. OK. So we removed the green screen. And to fix that, I need to come in a little bit. So I'm going to do my shrink grow. Come in a little bit. And I'll give this just a tiny touch of softness. There, that's pretty good. Now we're going to talk about alpha mats. I'm going to duplicate my effect. Command D or Control D. When you duplicate a layer, it duplicates all your keyframes, all your speed graph, and all your effects. It's very useful. The top, I'm going to keep my effect on. The bottom, I'm going to turn my effect off. To turn off an effect, select the layer. The FX right here, just click that, and that will turn off an effect. So I'm going to hide this. So alpha mats. Right here, this is to show or hide your transparency. This is positive space. This is negative space. The alpha mat will use my positive space or the negative space based on which I choose to knock through a layer like a cookie cutter. I'm going to turn this back on. To get a good, clean green screen, I had to make this pure white and pure black. And I'm going to use that as an alpha mat on the layer that does not have the green screen effect on it. So I need to be in my modes. These are my switches. I click switches and modes. Here's my modes. There's modes for blending modes. There's mats for alpha mats and luma mats. Here's the golden rule for mats. One layer revealing one layer. Has to be one layer. If it's more than one layer, pre-compose them together to create one layer. And remember the expression, a Halloween mask goes over your face. So the shape that's going to be my mat is on top. It's over what's being revealed or concealed. So here's what's going to be concealed and revealed. I go to that layer, to my track mats, and I look at the number. Here's my layer number. I want that. And it punched right through it. This is for alpha mat. I click once. That's for luma mat. We're going to talk about that in a second. Click again to choose between them. This is your invert 
selection. That's an alpha invert. That's a luma invert. So I can click there to turn it off and on. Alpha mats, as you can see, work off of the alpha, and you're going to get a harder soft edge based upon what your edges are for the alpha mat. Luma mats, I'll go click here. Luma, wet, Luma mats work off of shading. So pure white would be see through. I mean, pure white, white reveals, black conceals. So pure white's visible, pure black is invisible. And I could always adjust this by, it is important when you work with green screens, once you have it clean, pre-compose it, move all attributes. Now I can do something like curves and adjust my footage without changing the green screen inside it. So let's try this. Now you can see it's starting to affect the transparency because I'm changing the tone values of my layer. That's how Luma mats work. The shading controls the transparency, whereas with alpha mats, it's based off of shape. All right, so we covered alpha mats, luma mats, masks. Ah, I did not do this yet. And I'm glad I reminded myself. I'm going to go back to my pen tool. I'm going to click here. I'm going to give it just a stroke. And I'm going to turn this off so you don't have to stare at it the whole night. All right, here we go. I clicked and dragged to create my pen points, my path points. You can animate paths in After Effects. I'm going to twirl down. I'm going to go to my contents. You have to be at your path in order to do that. And you click on your path stopwatch. So I can move forward. And you'll notice once you start animating a path, this also works with masks as well. If you want to get one path point, I'm holding down shift to deselect that one point. You can change the Bezier curve handle. Or you can move a path point. So you can animate both your path points and your curve handles. That is how you animate paths in After Effects. Another way you can do it, I'm going to get rid of this. Click on the word path. Go window. Create nulls from paths. We got three options. Points follow nulls, which is what I use a lot, which means when I move the null, that this is it's going to parent this to. Nulls are invisible objects that you can parent things to, and they're very useful. So I'm glad I'm doing this. Points follow nulls. I move the null. The point moves. Nulls follow points. I move the point. The null moves. Trace path. I would put an object, and it will follow that path. So I'm going to do points follow nulls. And each path point has a null. So if I move this point, that's going to move my path point. I can also, I'll pick this one and I'll rotate it. Nothing's going to happen there. But if I add something, so I'm going to delete all this. And I'm going to use hard lines. So I'm just clicking. I'm not clicking and dragging. And let's say I want to do a cartoon arm. I'll make this thicker. And I'm going to go into my contents. Before I do any of that, I'm going to soften this up. That's all under my stroke options. I'm going to change my butt cap to round cap. That's the beginning and end. I'm going to change my miter join. I don't want that pointy elbow. I'm going to use round. And like that. This is how you can animate arms or legs or fingers like this. So I've got this looking the way I want. I need to go back to my path. We'll click on the word path, window, create nulls from paths, points follow nulls, and I close this. This is going to be my shoulder, that's going to be my elbow, and that's going to be my form, I mean my wrist. So I'm going to call this shoulder. I hit the enter key. I'm going to hit enter, forearm, and this is going to be my wrist. Hit enter. Now I'm going to parent these, and you'll see why. 
I hit rotate right now, nothing's going to happen. But if I parent them, parent my, oh wait, the other way, my forearm is parented to my shoulder. My wrist is parented to my forearm. Now watch what happens. Now they all move together because of the parenting and I can also move them separately. This is great because this will keep the volume of the leg or the arm when you work like this. And additionally, I'll just draw a hand. If this was a leg, I'd draw a foot, but I'm gonna draw a hand real quick. The greatest hand in the world. I'm gonna give it a fill and no stroke. Okay, I'm gonna call this hand. I'm gonna parent my hand to the wrist. Now, when I rotate my wrist, the hand moves with it. So I could create some complex animations by changing the timing of my different anchor points. So right about here, I could have my forearm start moving and have it go down. And then I could have the hand start moving last because it's the furthest from the body. And then I just ease, oops, all of these by clicking on empty space, left click and drag, hover over, right click, easy ease, like that. Boom, instant limb. So that's showing you how knolls, they're invisible in the scene and you can parent things to knolls. And another use for knolls is cameras. So we're gonna do a recap on parallax and cameras and that should be it for this quick recap because we've covered a lot of ground. So I'm just gonna make three shapes. Oh, lastly, if I've got my shape layer selected and I start drawing another shape, it makes that shape inside of the first shape. You may want this, you may not want this. If I wanna do negative space, like I've got this selected, I can select my shape, go add, Merge paths, and then choose what type of merge I want. Subtract, intersect, see right there, or exclude. All right, that's one way of getting that type of look by making your layers inside and adding merge paths. It's not what we're here for tonight. Well, we're all here to learn. So I want three different shapes because we're doing parallax. I'm going to make them three different colors. And lastly, I'll do a star. All right. So here's my three shapes. Watch what's going to happen. If I hit R for rotate, that's the type of rotation I can get. And if I do P for position, I've got X, which is side by side, or up and down, which is my Y. All of these are 2D. They're flat. I'm in my mode still. I need to be in my switches, so I click toggle switches and modes. I'm going to 3D enable all of these layers by clicking the 3D enable cube icon right here. So now watch what happens. If I hit R for rotate, I can rotate on any axes I want, like a swinging door or like a trap door opening, or still make it spin around like that. And for position, I hit P. I can now move side to side up and down, or closer or further from the camera. Okay, that's Z. So I've got my shapes, I've 3D enabled them. Now for parallax, I need to add a camera. I, to add anything, it's layer new, they're all right here. Cameras, lights, knolls, adjustment layers, I'll cover that in a second. So I got my layer, I'm gonna make camera, and here's the scene. Parallax, I'm going to hit P for position. You can open up a stopwatch for multiple layers by having multiple layers selected. You just click on one and then shift click on however many you want. And if you want to not get all your layers, you would hold down control or command to skip over the layers in between them. Parallax works by having your stuff spread out in Z space. So I'm going to do 5,000 back. This is going to be my mid-ground, and I'm going to go negative 5,000, so it's going towards the camera. 
up here are my camera controls. The first one is orbit. I click on this and I can hold down my left and click and you see it's orbiting from side to side or up and down. Go hit Command Z to undo. The second is my pan and tilt. If I click and hold down shift, I'm going side to side, that's a pan. Or I'm going to click, hold down shift and go up and down, that's a tilt, up and down is a tilt. So that's pan and tilt, that's orbit. And the last one, I click and I drag, that's my zoom out. So going in this direction zooms out, going in this direction will zoom in. Zoom in, zoom out. Now I can see all my objects. And the thing with parallax, it changes the distortion between space with your objects. It looks like they're getting further apart when the camera moves. Also, what's closest to the camera looks like it's moving faster, and what's furthest from the camera looks like it's moving slower. You'll notice, notice this in scroller, like scrolling side to side video games. That is parallax and 3D enabling shapes. All right. And then, oh, I was saying adding lights. Layer new, light. I'm gonna make a blue spotlight. And you can use your gizmo. The gizmo is your anchor point in 3D. So you click and you move and it'll snap to that one axis. That's how you do that. And for lights and cameras, you can go to their options, increase their intensity. See, now we're seeing that more. Change the color of your light if you want. Like that made it super bright and we're seeing further into the scene. You could also rotate your lights. That would be under transform. I'm going to get rid of this light. Now, I promised I'd show you something interesting with the nulls. So I'm going to add a null, layer new, null. I'm going to parent my camera to the null. But some people have trouble moving their camera around. So I'm going to 3D enable my null first. And you see I've got my gizmo. So if I grab a pick whip, I just go from my camera to the null. Watch what's going to happen. P for position. It's moving everything in the scene off of the axes that I want it to move on. Zoom in, zoom out on the Z, tilt on the Y, pan on the X. Not just that, R for rotate. Now I've got full control over which axes it's rotating on to really get the look that I want. So I could just keyframe this however I like. I can say I want this to tilt a little bit over time. And then let's work on the position. Go to P for position. Let's say right about here, I'm going to have it start moving to right about there. The less keyframes you have, the smoother your camera motions will be. Like such. Was there anything I did not recap that you would like me to? Oh, you know what? I got a second. I can show you a fly through before I forget. All right. So I'm going to make a solid. I'll call this background. And I'm going to make it, I'll make it blue just so we can see what's going on. Okay. Here's my solid. And I'm going to put that video clip I had me in the background. So there's me in the background. There's the solid. And I'll put a logo. Now, you know what? I will do a solid instead, just because it's faster and easier. All right, there we go. Fly throughs work off of alpha invert maps. And what's that mean? So, this is the shape I want to use for my alpha mat. Here's what's below it. I've got to be in my modes. So, I click switches and modes. Oops, click switches and modes. I'm going to set this. Look at my number. I want number one. I want an alpha invert. I click here. So what this did was it 
did a cookie cutter. It made a hole through the middle layer. So my top layer is punching through my middle layer to reveal the layer behind, like a fly-through animation, like we talked about with um, Stranger Things, like flying through the text. So I just scale up the object I want to be my fly-through. So I go here, and let's just go to here, and I just scale up, and there you have it. We're flying through the scene into that. Now, what would be smart is I'm going to scale down this scene a little bit that I'm going to fly into, and I'm going to animate that so that as I fly through, it scales up. That's what sells the effect. Watch. See? That's the difference. Think through your motion design, and you'll be far more successful. Think about how things interact with each other, how they affect one another. I'm going to delete these. All right, so here's my scene. Here's my image. All right. And I'm going to put a bend effect on it. I'm going to go to my effects, bend, and I'm going to use CC Bender. Now we talked a little bit about, about talked a little bit about effects. And whenever you see these crosshairs, that means you can click once and then click somewhere else. For bend, the base does not move and the top does move, like a blade of grass swaying in the wind or a branch of a tree swaying with the wind. So I'm going to click once on my base, then say where I want my base to be. That's what's not going to move. Click once, set my top. This is what's going to move. See, that's creating the bend effect. Now. As we learned, you can put expressions on things. So I'm going to hold down Alt or Option, click in there, and I'm going to type in wiggle, double click to autocomplete, let's say twice a second, comma, 15 something subtle. I got to click out. Now I hit my space bar. I've got a gently swaying flower in the wind. That's an example of using these rather than trying to use your coordinates. And I'm also going to show you one more thing before I forget, R for rotate. This number right here is for setting a degree. This number right here is for total rotations. So if I click there, move forward, and I say three full rotations, this will spin around three full times. Sets so full rotations, and that's for setting up an angle rotation. Okay, and I've got a second. So lastly, I'm going to recap displacement maps. Displacement maps are a fast way of getting some uh, cool motion. So the layer, new, solid, put that on top, put a noise on top. I'll do, I'll do fractal noise. And then I'll recap with the uh, distressing geometric shapes real fast. All right. So remember, with maps, black goes one direction, white goes the opposite direction. So the more contrast you have, the greater the effect will be. Evolution, I'm just going to do a time effect here. I have time expression. I held down Alt or Option. Time, asterisk, uh, let's say... 200. So that's evolving at that rate. Transform. This is where you can change the scale of your noise. The larger the noise, the more uh, rough it's going to be, and the smaller, the more fine the detail is going to be. You could also non uniformly scale it if you wanted to get like blocks or solid lines. That's just showing you that. And then your offset turbulence. That's the direction the noise is going to be going. I want it to be going up. So I'm going to click Offset Turbulence, move forward, and then that's up. So going to a smaller number is what's making it move up. So that's how that's happening. All right, great. I'm going to click the eyeball to hide that. And I'm going to have a displacement map and have that dis affect my type. Here's my displacement map. Put it on my type. Here's where I choose my logo. 
there. That's the layer that's distressing it right there, the blue. And they can choose the amount. Which direction it's going, horizontally or vertically. I just hit the space bar, and I've got distressed stuff. This is great for doing like paint splotches, water, and fire. You just make your displacement look like, uh, you make your map look like the effect you want to emulate. I'm gonna get rid of you, put a circle. All right, this is a boring geometric shape. You could always throw a rough and edges effect on it. And I'll increase this. Now, if I want to get a better look, I can click here to hide my path. That's a little tip there. And then you just do your drop down and change the sharpness. You can get a smoky look by going to zero, or you can get a harder edge look. But right now, you see how doing that, you automatically have a more organic, interesting shape. And as you move it around, that roughness is animating with it. All right. And the last thing I'm going to do, because I'm almost done the lecture, I'm going to recap on bounding boxes and why you got to watch out for them. All right. Here's my letter A. I'm going to click on my alpha, the transparency. This is negative space. This is positive space. And look at this red box around my shape. Even though my A is triangular, bounding boxes in After Effects are always going to be a square or a rectangle. And it says this is the absolute dimensions that this shape layer, that this layer is taking up in my scene. So what does that mean? I'll show you. I'm going to put a CC light rays on here. Whenever you're working with light effects, I'm going to go to my project. Here's your effects controls. There's your projects. You want to be at a higher bit depth to get more detail. So I'm going to hold down the Alt or Option key and click on 8 bits per channel until it gets to 32 bits per channel. Conversely, you could click again to go lower. So I'm going to go up to 32 bits. Now, this is why you got to watch out for bounding boxes. My effect is going to the bounding box and then hitting a hard stop, OK? Because it's saying this is how much space this layer is taking up. So I'm going to go back to my effects controls. I'm going to copy that effect and delete it. Now, to override this, the first step in troubleshooting in After Effects is pre-composing. So I'm going to right click with my layer selected, pre-compose it. I'll call it A, PC for pre-comp. Click on move attributes so it lights up blue. Now, this is the bounding box. It's going to the edges of the screen. So if I paste my effect on, now it's going all the way to the edge of the screen, as you can see, the way it should. And anything with a stopwatch usually can be animated. So I just move forward over time, and I can click and drag to animate that light effect. And now it's behaving properly. Just like that. That's the difference between alpha, positive and negative space, and bounding boxes, and how they can affect and influence what you're putting in your scene in After Effects. Any questions on that recap? And then just a reminder about particles. I'm going to go layer new solid. OK. And this is the last thing I'm going to go over for real this time. All right. Particle World is the only 3D one in After Effects. So I'm going to throw that on here. And I'm going to use that flower that I had before. OK, so if you're doing a custom and right here, you're saying, oh, there's trouble here. That's because I'm still at 32 bits per channel. Doesn't play nicely in Particle World. All right. I'm going to need. A custom particle. Custom particles should be 200 pixels by 200 or 400 by 400. The bigger you make your custom particle, the more processor it's going to take up, and you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot, and you're just not going to be working quick. So I'd suggest trying to go 200 by 200. So I clicked on my new comp button here. Or I could go composition, new composition there. Here's where I'm going to make my custom particle size. 200, 200. Block aspect ratio is turned off. I'll call this uh, flower 
particle so I know what I'm looking for. I'm going to hit OK. Now I've got a 200 by 200 composition. I'm going to scale this down. Your particle has to fit completely inside of your custom particle, or else you'll get hard edges. All right. So that means I take my custom particle, put it into the composition that I have my particle system in. See, because over here, that's my custom particle comp. I clicked here and made a new comp first before making it 200 by 200. This is still 1920 by 1080. I can hide my custom particle, go in here, and this is where I load it up. So I want this to look like a field of flowers growing, your producer. And now first we're gonna do our physics. You hit the space bar to preview it, and I'm gonna drop down my resolution to see it faster. That's not what I want. I'm going to do something like, let's try direction axes. Okay, this is sort of what I want. I want the flowers going in a direction. I'm going to lower my velocity. The velocity is how far they go from your generator. And right here, producer, that's my producer. That's what's creating it. I can move the producer. I could also say how big it is in a certain direction. I don't want it to be on Y because the flowers, I don't want them going off the ground. And then the Z, I can have them go closer or further in space. All right, so right here, that's what's happening. Okay, now the birth rate, I'm going to want that many and the longevity, I want them to stay a long time. Up the birth rate, okay. You always get your particle system moving the way you want and then you work on the look of the particles in it. Gravity, I'm gonna set that to zero so that they're not going up or down. Resistance, increasing that will weaken your particle system. See, now I just have them spread out, which is basically what I wanted all along. So I could say I want that, I want a very small y, and then a large x like this. Now I'll set this to where I want the ground. Yep, that's starting to look like a field of flowers now. It's behaving like a field of flowers. So if I don't want them to fade on like that, I could move my particle system and extend the edge. So that's much better. Now they're behaving the way I want. We're going to fine tune our look, and that's in your particle. And a quick reminder, opacity map, by default, they're fading on and fading off. Flowers don't fade. So I just click and drag inside there to make it solid black so it's not fading off or on. Maximum opacity, I'm going to set that to 100 because flowers aren't really see-through. And this is starting to look like what we want. So I go to my particle. And just a reminder, this is where you change what your particles look like. Custom particles are down here. Textured squared, textured disk, and textured faded. I'm going to show you the difference between the three. Textured square, whenever you choose one of them, you've got to choose your texture, and that's going to be your custom particle. So I choose that, and I'll do effects and mask. Now, the flowers, I'm not going to have them change over their life. But if you wanted, you could have them get bigger or smaller. The birth is the size they are when they're born. The death is the size they are when their life runs out. That's their longevity. So I'm just going to do, let's try three. Uh, I'll try 2.5. 2.5 and then 2.5. Okay. So there's my flowers. We talked about the opacity map and maximum opacity. If I want to keep the color of my custom particle, I just set both my birth and my death to white. But you could always use color to uh, get something more you know, custom or you know, to create a special effect. So there are my flowers filling up the field very quickly. You could change your transfer mode. Screen is what you would use for light effects like fire and lasers. Add the more they layer on top of each other, the brighter they get. And composite is used for things that should be solid, like smoke or flowers. And if you did do uh, smoke and you wanted it to be like fog, you would just change your max opacity, get that more vapory or gas-like look.
And you could also animate particles with the still image, or you could use video clips for particles. It's really up to you. I'm going to lower this particle count and I'll tell you the difference. So textured square, all your particles face the same direction, which is what would be great for trees or blades of grass or flowers, things like that. They are growing up in one direction. They're not rotated. If you chose textured disc, they randomly rotate around. This is good for more random things like fire and smoke. So that's when you would, might use that. And everything has a hard edge when you choose textured square or textured disc. Texture faded disc, they soften around the edges. This is for blending things together like fire and other special effects. When you don't want to see hard edges between your textures, you would use texture faded disc and you get that random rotation. And lastly, while I've got these rotated like this, I'm going to do physics. And right here, resist extra. Increasing the extra, that's sort of like the randomness of this. So if you need things to be uniform, you'd want your extra to be zero and your extra angle to be zero. So I'm just pointing that out for you. And if you're having issues with your particle system, how it's facing, you could always choose effect camera and rotate it that way off of the axes you need it to be rotated on. See how much deeper we made that by adjusting our field of view. You could also do a depth cue if you wanted, have stuff fade off into the distance and choose how far that distance is. So I'm going to set my particle type back to textured square, set they're all going the right way, uh, my particle count. And now you can see that fade off into the horizon more accurately. All right, so that's our recap on custom particles. Anybody have any questions over any of that recap we did tonight? And if not, did it help you to see everything a second time around? Okay, and I recorded it because I am benevolent. All right, so, you know, best luck with your final projects and it's lab time. Does anyone have anything for me to look at in lab time tonight?